One of the very few perks of living with a rare terminal illness is the way nothing ever seems important enough to get stressed about. See, I'm speaking from my own limited experience, and in no way would I recommend you go out and get your own rare terminal illness, if you don't already have one. But in my case, I was able to make peace with the reality of my impermanence early on. Before the diagnosis, when I was a young teenager, sometimes I would worry about living up to my own expectations for adulthood, which is absurd when you consider that the town I grew up in is the capital of lowered expectations, whose only claim to fame is being the home of a famous bloody civil war battle, and the place where it rained frogs that one time. Eh, don't ask. It's not nearly as interesting as it sounds. I work at the 24-hour gas station near the woods at the edge of town, and as far as jobs go, it's not the best, but it's not the worst either. Knowing that I won't be here too much longer dulls any ambition to climb the corporate ladder. You know, some days churn by without incident, moving the world one step closer to oblivion, or whatever. Those are my favorites, when I can pass an entire shift by reading a book and minding my own business. I don't need to climb a mountain or, or visit the Grand Canyon to know what Zen feels like. Tranquility is a quiet, empty gas station at four in the morning. Of course, some days aren't as uneventful. I've experienced rude customers, drunkards, vicious raccoons that fall on the chaotic evil spectrum of the D&D &D alignment, a handful of armed robbers, and some other things that I can only describe as... weird. I had one of the last type of days yesterday. We had been busier than normal in the weeks leading up to this. Some of the wildlife and fishery agents from nearby towns had been patrolling the woods pretty heavily. And our gas station is the only place for miles to get fuel or fresh coffee. I don't know what the hubbub was about, but I would guess everyone's been on edge ever since those cows were mutilated. Okay, I think that maybe mutilated is too strong of a word to use. Somebody has been sneaking into cattle farms and shaving the cows bald. Who knows why? Small towns get bored. I, mean, I wasn't paying attention to the time because I never do, but it was late in my shift in the middle of the night when the deer poked his head inside the gas station. I had just finished my book and was checking my phone for weather updates when it happened. The glass door was pushed slightly ajar and a large deer with an eight point rack of antlers was slowly inspecting the store, scanning its gaze from one corner to the other's nostrils flaring each sniff. It stopped moving and pointed its giant black eyes right at me. I remained perfectly still, except to put my phone down because this was more interesting than the possible snowstorm headed our way in the next few days. We stared at one another for just a moment longer until the deer pushed the door the rest of the way open and stepped one foot inside. Now whatever you're imagining right now, it's wrong. And I know that's my fault because I'm telling you this story, so I apologize. There were a few key details to this deer that I haven't mentioned yet. First, the deer's head was about seven feet off the ground, and second, I could see through the glass of the front doors that this deer was standing upright. From antler tip to pelvis, the deer was just like any other ordinary white tail that I had ever seen in the woods or the this side of the interstate. Tan fur, long neck, confused expression, but at the legs, he turned into something else. If kangarooish was a word, I would call his legs kangarooish. He stepped a kangarooish foot into the store and waited like he was making sure that the ground wasn't going to fall out from below him. When it didn't, he put the next foot forward. The door shut behind him and the deer started walking down the gas station aisle, his antlers barely missing the fluorescent lights hanging from the ceiling by millimeters. I didn't think much of it at the time, but when I got to work earlier that night, the other worker said something interesting. I was taking over the safe from the only other full-time clerk, Jerry, who according to what I heard from a pretty reliable source, has been pretty salty ever since his cult went and had a mass suicide without inviting him. Before he left, he told me that the lag was getting worse and maybe it was time we do something about it. Well, see, there's something wrong with the mirror in the gas station bathroom. There's a delay in the reflection by about a half a second. Sometimes if the weather's acting up, it gets much worse, or at least more noticeable. We had plans to replace the mirror, but couldn't do it because we're lazy. And mirrors are expensive, and besides, how important is it to see your exact reflection anyway? 
It's a gas station bathroom, not a salon. That wasn't the weird thing, he told me. The weird thing was that a man had come by earlier wearing hunter's camo and left his number, telling Jerry that it was imperative that he contact him in case we see anything unusual. I had dismissed that as being too vague to have any meaning at all. What is unusual at the gas station? A solar eclipse? A bipedal deer? A completely normal day? Besides, I don't work for him, and if he's looking for the deer creature, he can find it on his own. I watched the deer walk slowly towards the bag chips display and put his nose to it, sniffing voraciously before stepping back and scanning the entire store again. His arms? Or, uh, or front legs? I'm not sure. Dangled at his sides with with cloven hooves as he walked over to the refrigerator drink case. He tapped the glass a couple times with his antlers before figuring out how to reach out and pull the door. It was like watching a toddler figuring out a puzzle. It's frustrating. I almost got up to help him, but then finally, mercifully, he got his hand, toe, clo, toe, foot finger around the handle and the door creaked open. I had to hold back my laughter as the deer fumbled at a bottle of water and somehow managed, barely, to pull it out of the case before sticking the top of it into his mouth and chewing at the cap until it ripped open. The deer leaned his head back with the bottle sticking out of his mouth and stared right at me as he guzzled the whole thing down in one continuous stream. Next, the buck sauntered over to the coffee machine and gave it a whiff. The smell apparently didn't g-haw with his disposition and he reared back and shook his head fiercely. Probably for the best. Finally, the buck finished his round and walked up to me and stopped on the other side of the counter. From this close, I could smell the creature, and surprisingly, he smelled like grape soda. He tapped his hooves, fingers, hands, on the counter a couple of times, then looked back to where he had dropped the bottle of water, then back to me. Okay, I said. He tapped the counter again, so I went ahead and punched in the code for a bottle of water at the register. That's going to be 89 cents. The deer took a step back, looked down at himself, and started patting his body where his pockets would be, if he were wearing any pants. Then he looked up at me and blinked a few times. You're putting me in an awkward spot here, I said. Right then, the creature started belting out a strange animalistic noise that I can only describe as a combination between donkey and dolphin. I don't know what that means, I said over his noise. But then he just got louder and louder and then threw his head back, emitting this weird call into the ceiling. I don't know what you're saying, I said back. I don't speak deer. The creature threw its head back down, barfed up a green wet clump into the counter in front of me, and then it was silent. I looked at the clump. The deer looked at the clump. The deer looked at me. Then back at the clump. Oh, I reached out. I grabbed it by the corner. Sure enough, the deer had coughed up a mucus-covered $1 bill. Okay. I wiped the sliminess off on a dish rag I kept near the register for spills and then put the bill into the till with the rest of the money before fishing out two nickels and a penny, which I offered to the deer, in which the deer promptly ate out of my hand. He turned towards the door and flicked his tail a few times at me before I noticed the strange to blue outside the gas station. At least half a dozen other deer were out there, each standing tall on two kangaroo feet and staring right at me. There was another stag, a pack of does, at least one fawn, only four feet tall. The buck struggled for a few seconds to pull the door open. Do you want me to? Before I could finish, he had it wide enough to slip outside. Then they all left walking proudly towards the forest line. It wasn't until about five minutes later that it occurred to me that I should have taken a picture or something, but without any proof, I guess it's just going to turn into one of those weird stories that nobody ever believes. I dug through my backpack until I found a book that I hadn't read yet. I opened to the front page. It was at least another hour before I had another customer come into the store. In case you were following along with the events of the gas station on my blog, I apologize that my website's been taken down so abruptly. For some reason, the city council found my public record of local events to be troubling. 
uh, to the point that they had to hire a fancy Orwellian legal team to bury me in cease and desist. I'm trying to fight back. But as of last week, it looks like my entire site's been retroactively erased from existence. Presumably, these are the same guys who've been scrubbing all mention of our town from the internet. I know that these are not the sort of people that you're supposed to fight with, but after what happened to Gregory Fitz, I feel like a responsibility to continue journaling in one form or another. Some of you who followed my blog may remember Greg as the lawyer who volunteered to help out pro bono after I first started getting pushback from the concerned members of the city council. He even drove all the way out here last week just to have a talk with them. I'm very sorry to say that they found his remains yesterday in a hotel room, locked from the inside, of course. Officially, his death was declared a suicide before it was sealed. Deputy O'Brien managed to get a look at the police report, which claims he died of blood loss while attempting to eat his own hands. Admittedly, I didn't know Greg all that well. That just doesn't seem like something he would do. Anyway, until I can figure things out on the website, I've decided to continue chronicling the events of my day-to-day -day here. If you haven't been following my blog and have absolutely no idea who I am, that's okay too. Let me just say that there's only two things you need to know that will bring you completely up to speed. One, I work at the shitty 24-hour gas station at the edge of town. And two, weird things happen there. The owners decided to hire a third part-time clerk, and I don't know if it's because that they're getting tired of all the part-timers mysteriously disappearing, or if it's because they finally decided to fire Jerry. Or maybe they just know that my time here is running out, and they're hoping that I can train my own replacement before it's too late. Her name is Rosa, and despite her eager optimism, I guess she's pretty cool. She's a couple years younger than me, smart, very capable, and has exhibited a level of competence that I would categorize as, uh, quote, not at all like Jerry, which is something that I think the owners were really looking for in a new employee. The flip side, though, is that she is always asking questions that I don't have answers to. Why are there so many missing persons flyers on the bulletin board? What's with all the mold on the ceiling? Who's that guy in the trench coat that hangs out near the dumpster at all hours of the night? What's in these boxes labeled non-aspire? The owners asked Rosa to start immediately, as my shadow for the week's overnight shifts. You might think the owners would shut the place down for a couple hours for the holidays, but you'd be wrong. See, it took a literal court order to make them close their doors for a weekend last month after we found a mummified corpse in the walls. That's a story for a different time. She came into the gas station just as the sun was beginning to set, and we started with the basics. How to clock in, how to open a till, how to turn on pumps. Then I gave her the same speech I give all the new employees. Look, there are a bunch of rules to working at any job. We're no different. Show up on time, wear clothing, don't feed the raccoons, the store telephone is for paying customers only, 25 cents per minute, prepaid only, no exceptions, and just like every job, there are the unwritten rules. Here, the second list is a little longer. If something seems weird, you try to ignore it. In fact, the more you ignore, the better off you'll be. Don't keep track of time. Don't go off investigating weird noises on your own. Don't touch the garden gnomes with the green hats. Why? She asked. What's wrong with the gnomes with the green hats? Sometimes they bite. They set a few employees to urgent care for stitches. Wow. What about customers? Yeah, most of them bite too. Okay, what can you tell me about... You know. You know? She whispered this next part with a sly grin. The animals. This was the moment I first realized that Rosa's steadfast and defiant curiosity might be a problem. What about the animals? I asked. Well, I heard a rumor from Jerry that the woods way out here past the edge of town are full of strange fauna, and sometimes, when night falls, the inhabitants of the forest get brave and wander closer to the gas station. She said the whole thing 
in that stupid, spooky Vincent Price voice you use when reading a ghost story to a group of first graders? Uh, Jerry, you idiot. Look, Jerry says and smokes a lot of things. I wouldn't pay much attention. He also told me something else, she confessed. Is it true that you can't fall asleep? Yeah, it's true. That's pretty cool. No. No, not really. Right on cue, Jerry walked into the gas station wearing nothing but a wife beater jeans and a camo trucker hat covered in fresh snow. Some people like to go home once their shift ends. Some people even manage to stay away from their place of employment all the way until their next shift begins. But as he reminds me time and time again, Jerry is not, quote, some people. You guys, it's colder than a stepmother's kiss out there. As usual, he didn't wait for any response. He just grabbed the bottle of whiskey off the shelf and walked up to Rosa and pointed at a pack of Marlboros. What are you doing? She asked. Aren't you freezing? Oh, yeah. Didn't you hear what I just said? I'm as cold as a witch's dick. Rosa handed over the pack of cigarettes and rang him up, saying, I don't think that's how the expression goes. You ever felt a witch's dick? It's pretty freaking cold. She chuckled. Does that pickup line ever work? You'd be surprised. She gave Jerry his total, but he just winked at her, put it on my employee tab, before turning around and walking back out into the fallen snow. Rosa looked at me with a confused expression. How do I ring something up under an employee tab? <sighs> we don't have employee tabs. So, yeah, Jerry just robbed us. The night passed like most, boring and slow. The snowstorm had kicked up at high gear, dropping the customer count to a trickle, maybe one or two per hour. It doesn't take long to show the new girl everything there was to the job, and before too long my brain was back on autopilot, and I was relaxing in a chair with an open book, but a hard-boiled big city detective. Rosa took the utterly pointless initiative to clean the place up a little. I think the dullness of the job was really starting to test her limits. The grind of long hours and the space between those events that form memories is where I like to hide, where I can relax and wait and forget about all the things knocking at the door of my mind. How many days have passed since the last time you slept? I wonder what she who shall not be named is doing right now. She promised you would see each other again. Will your mind still be intact when the disease takes you? Do you think she'll come to your funeral? Yep, take those thoughts, push them back into the vault, and focus on the shitty book you bought from the library clearance sale. Around midnight, Rosa ran up to the counter with a cardboard box and slammed it down in front of me. I looked up to see an enormous smile on her face. Yo, check out what I found in the storage closet. Before I could say no thanks, she flipped the box upside down and dumped the contents onto the counter. It was a giant, tangled ball of Christmas lights, plastic garland, holiday decorations, and a freshly dead mouse. Oh, she said, her smile instantly evaporated. I didn't know about the mice. I put my book down and started refilling the box while she went and found some napkins to wrap the rodent. About an hour later, the decorations were back in the storage room. The mice were all stuffed together in an old shoebox, and I was leaning against my crutches, in the pouring snow while Rosa dug a tiny grave. There was something particularly cathartic about watching somebody else dig a hole next to the gas station, thinking to myself if she only knew all the things that happened with that shovel, I highly doubt that she'd be so gung-ho about putting her fingerprints all over it. I selected one of those few spots where we hadn't already buried something horrific, and once the mice were in the ground, Rosa gave a short eulogy. Christmas mice? Oh, Christmas mice, how we never knew ye. I'm sorry you all died in a box in the supply closet, but I'm grateful that at least you didn't have to die alone. We pray that you don't haunt this gas station. Instead, may you find your peace in heaven, or whatever your mouse religion equivalent is. Yeah, probably Valhalla. When they say not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse, we will know that it wasn't for lack of trying. She looked at me and asked, anything to add? My mind jumped to a short list of mouse-based puns, but instead I decided to go with, yeah, somebody once came into the gas station trying to be a dick, and he told me that I was nothing but a little mouse. I think he meant it as an insult, but I didn't take offense. She nodded. That was really nice. 
we all started making our way back into the gas station. I heard a voice from just beyond the tree line whispering, Hey! Rosa stopped and looked back. Do you hear that? The freezing wind carried with it a noise that almost sounded like children giggling as it blew against the back of my neck. Nope, I said. Let's go back inside. It was some time later when the store phone rang. Now I had gone to the supply closet to grab a bucket of salt for the front steps, so Rosa was the one to pick it up. I could hear her side of the conversation and didn't think too much about it until I heard the very last words. It's not bad, I think. This is my first day here. Oh. Oh, I like it. I, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Rosa. Yeah, actually. He's right here. Did you want to talk to him? Oh, oh, sure thing. I'll let him know. You too, Spencer. Oh, shit. She smiled at me and said, That was a friend of yours. Spencer... Middleton, I said with a sigh. Yeah! Once again, I watched her smile disappear. I guess she could tell from the look on my face. This was not good news. I need to make a phone call. Then, I think it's probably about time that I told you... Uh, something. Back in high school, we all pretty much knew that Spencer was a certifiable psychopath. But growing up in a small, boring, podunk town, we didn't have the societal framework to process this sort of thing. Finding him the help he needed was simply not a feasible option, and most people just said a prayer for him and called it done. At one point, the principal delegated the responsibility to the school counselor slash gym coach, who tried to talk to Spencer about his feelings. All this was just the equivalent of putting a band-aid on a grease fire. There was a rumor around that time that Spencer was the one who had killed all those dogs. But when I told my mother about this, she just looked at me and said, Well, don't go near him with any dogs. After dropping out, he joined the army and worked his way up through the ranks until somebody recognized his... Let's say, talents, and gave him a special assignment in a black budget program specializing in enhancing interrogation techniques, which is just a flashy way of saying torture. There's no official record of any of this, and the only reason I know is because he told me all these things one night to pass time while I dug my own grave at gunpoint. Now, Deputy O'Brien managed to intervene and arrest him before he could follow through, but Spencer escaped captivity after a few days, and for the last couple of months has been a wanted but elusive fugitive. Sometimes, he calls me at work to remind me of the good times we had together, and to assure me that he'll be seeing me again soon. Now, I don't know if it's luck that's been keeping him from killing me, or the sadist in him is prolonging this intentionally. Tonight, he told Rosa to let me know that he was in the area. As for why Spencer wanted to kill me, let me simply say that maybe I deserve it, and maybe I don't, and we should leave it at that. The first thing I did was call O'Brien, but it went straight to voicemail. The second thing I did was tell all of this to Rosa, who listened patiently until I finished to ask the obvious question. So, do you have a gun or anything? In case he comes back? No, I... I'm not really a gun guy. Ninja stars, bazooka, flamethrower, chainsaw, any of the... weapon type stuff? No. Oh, well, shit. Maybe you deserve to be killed. Should we lock the doors or something? Oh yeah, that's another thing. Spencer knows how to get inside the gas station even when the doors are locked. He's done it, like, a couple of times before, and we haven't been able to figure out how. Well, crap, man! Is there anything else terrifying about him that you want to tell me? I once saw Spencer get his head cut halfway off and bleed out on the gas station floor, and he still somehow came back without any lasting damage. No, not really. The gas station door swung open, causing Rosa to squeak and jump. Hey guys, said the inebriated man in the oversized fur coat as he staggered into the store. Hey Jerry, I said back. Where you been? You know the roads are all shut down, he said, avoiding the question. It didn't matter. I already knew the answer. Rosa asked, what about the roads? Jerry braced himself against the frozen drink machine and answered, Yeah, it's all over the radio. If you were a little closer, I probably would have smacked him. God knows he deserved it. Really, Jerry? The radio? We're not supposed to talk about it, but... Some time ago, Jerry started a pet project building a POW-style shortwave radio, just to see if he could. He uncoiled an old Brillo pad and wrapped it around a toilet paper roll for the inductor went to Vulture on a couple of electronics in the storage. Eventually, ended up with something that actually picked up a few low-quality AM country stations. They'd also picked up something else. The signal is always weak. But if we put the radio in just the right spot, we can hear a man 
with a Slavic accent, reading or discussing news relevant to our town in short, simple, choppy sentences. The weird thing is, he's always talking, no matter what, 24 hours a day without taking any breaks and never repeating himself. The temperature is 84 degrees. There are three more people in town than yesterday. The ratio of pig to human in town is approximately 2.078 to 1. The mayor's wife is asleep. The time is 24 hours and 16 minutes. The butcher shop is closed. The light is on at the high school gym. He talks about people in town, where they're eating for dinner, how many pairs of shoes they own, their favorite clothes and numbers, random facts, sometimes connected, sometimes not. We did a couple of experiments and learned that the radio signal gets a little stronger the further we go into the woods, and once we get past the gas station heading into town, the signal drops to nothing. We listen to him off and on for a few days, as well to starve off boredom during slow shifts, but eventually we started to get a little concerned. The things he reported on were always so specific and bizarre, and some of what the voice repeated nobody should have been able to know. Who didn't love who anymore? What high school student was about to find out she was pregnant? Which local business was about to receive a random health inspector visit? How many days the milk at the grocery store had left before it turned bad? And who was going to buy it? And when? We had theorized it was just an elaborate work of fiction, until one day the voice announced Sean Buckley's death in a car accident eight hours before it happened. Then the voice started talking about us. Talking to us, even. There's a man at gas station. He uses name Jack. He still has one baby tooth. He has been diagnosed with fatal familial insomnia. He is threat level 8. He is aware of transmission. There is another man at gas station. His name is Jeremy. He is threat level Echo. He is aware of transmission. He is 30 years old. He is looking at Jack. The men at gas station have built transmission receiver. Jeremy at gas station is moving towards transmission receiver. He is dismembering transmission. After that night, we made a pact to never listen to the radio again. And to add the transmission to that long list of try and forget stories, I think what most people swear on their lives not to do something again, they don't do it. Did I mention that Jerry isn't most people? There is a freak snowstorm, the worst one in a decade. All the roads leading into town are completely impassable. You know the drill. Mandatory curfew. State of emergency. Cats and dogs living together. Jeremy waved his arms in the air dramatically. Two dead, one missing. He grabbed a cup, filled it with cherry cola flavored frozen drink, and started to down it. If all the roads are impassable, and where the hell did you just come from? asked Rosa. I whispered to her. Remember that thing I told you about ignoring the weird stuff? Jerry screamed, Ah! Oh, what is it? Brain freeze! Well, at least we still have... Right then, the power went out. Leaving the gas station in complete pitch blackness. I used my phone's flashlight until I could find our box of emergency supplies, then somehow managed to drag it from the storage room with one hand while holding both crutches in the other. Ugh. I'm sure Jerry was just being kind by allowing me to do it on my own so I could retain my independence and sense of worth. But seriously, dude, you see me dragging this heavy-ass thing, you really just not gonna offer any help? Once I had made it to the front of the store, Jerry sat down cross-legged and started going through the box, handing supplies out to the four of us. I had packed plenty of extra batteries, half a dozen flashlights, some bottled water, emergency rations, matches, flares, and more than enough- Wait a second. Four of us? Holy shit! I yelled, fumbling with the flashlight Jerry had handed me. After a painfully awkward few seconds, I managed to get the damn thing to turn on, and I pointed it at the other shadow standing in the room. Jerry, 
Rosa, and... Oh, Deputy O'Brien. Hey, you mind not pointing that in my eyes? She asked. Deputy Amelia O'Brien was the latest in an ever-growing list of deputy babysitters assigned to the gas station, getting all the way back to as long as I can remember. Some of them died. One of them went crazy. And then there's her. A tough-as-brick Brooklyn transplant with an itchy trigger finger and a long history of giving as many fucks as there are planets named Pluto. She was a very welcome sight. <laughs> Sorry, I said, pointing it back down. When did you get here? Just now, when you were off bumble-fucking around in the closet. I called to check on you 30 minutes ago, but nobody answered. And I nearly killed myself ten times driving through this blizzard to get here. What the hell happened? Rosa perked up. Oh, we were probably outside doing the funeral when you called. She unsnapped the gun in her holster. You... what? I explained quickly. It was for a bunch of mice. Jerry brustled. And you didn't invite me? O'Brien shook her head and said, That actually does not clear anything up. I took a deep breath and broke the bad news. It's a good thing you're here. Spencer called again. Said that he's in the area. Jerry opened the emergency pack of jerky, took a bite, and then said, That kid is so in love with you. The deputy raised an eyebrow at the new girl. Who are you? I'm Rosa. It's my first day. Amelia O'Brien. Really? You don't look like an O'Brien. What does an O'Brien look like? An awkward silence followed. And then Jerry broke it by exclaiming, Yeah, we finally passed the bachelor test. It's a nice change of pace. Usually, when we end up trapped at the gas station, it's a total sausage fest. Usually? This happens before? Uh, once or twice. O'Brien spoke in her walkie-talkie. Dispatch is O'Brien. You read me? Over. Silence. Dispatch, are you hearing me? Over. More silence. She sighed and dug a dollar out of her pocket, handing it over to me, and she said, I need to use the store phone. But before I could even take the money, the phone started ringing. She shot me a look and said, Hey, crutches, pick it up. Put it on speaker. Without thinking, I tucked the flashlight into my mouth, crossed the store, and when I got there, I reached out to answer, then immediately spat the flashlight out and yelled, Oh my god! What? O'Brien shot back. I put that in my mouth and mice have been doing weird stuff to it. I put it in my mouth! Store phone rang a couple more times. O'Brien said, Just answer the damn phone! I did. Hello? Hey, Jack. It's been too long. I pressed the button to switch to speakerphone. Hey, Spencer. Who's your new friend? I looked at O'Brien. He made a weird hand gesture that could have meant keep him talking or... Yeehaw, let's rob this bank. Between the current context, I assumed that it was the former. Oh, her... Uh, the girl that you talked to earlier is my new jujitsu instructor. I had to fire the last one because he hadn't already taught me everything he knew. I've been getting pretty rad since the last time I saw you. Also, I'm taller now. She doesn't look like a jujitsu instructor to me. And neither does the lady deputy next to her. And is that Jerry? He looks drunk. O'Brien pulled out her service pistol, crisscrossed it with her flashlight in the opposite hand, and started pointing it at each of the windows and doors. Jerry always looks drunk, I said. Hey, <laughs> said Jerry with a hiccup. O'Brien took the phone from me and slammed it into the cradle before yelling, Everybody, get away from the windows right now! Jack, take the others, lock yourselves in the storage closet, go! I sighed and said, Fine. The next few hours were pretty damn boring. O'Brien had checked our perimeter, called for backup, and declared the situation tentatively safe in the time it took Jerry and Rosa to fall asleep in the closet. I covered them in packing blankets, then put one around my shoulders and tried to read my book by candlelight, but the situation was just too distracting to let myself get into it. O'Brien eventually joined us in a small room, reporting that there were no signs of Spencer anywhere, and if it wasn't for the fact that somebody had slashed all the tires on our cruiser and Rosa's Volkswagen Beetle, she might have been tempted to believe that he was just yanking our chain. So, what's the deal with the backup? I whispered to her as she came and sat down on a milk crate next to me. The others were knocked out, and I was just fine letting them sleep off as much as they could. O'Brien looked at them while she searched for the words. I don't know what's going on with you crutches, but ever since I was assigned to this job, my life has gotten exponentially weirder with every passing day. Yeah, I said picking up the edge from my blanket and putting it over her shoulders. She moved in a little closer and whispered, Talk to the sheriff. 
He sent in a snow truck out here first thing in the morning. Tried to tell him that this needs to be a priority, but evidently this is a snowmageddon. Can't afford to stretch his precious resources any further tonight. Yeah, that sounds about right. What about her? I thought you and Jerry pretty much ran this place. I laughed. <laughs> we don't run anything. She put a warm arm around my shoulder and said, Yeah, I'm really going to miss you when you die. Thanks. That's um pretty presumptuous of you. So far, I've outlived almost every deputy they sent. Rosa shot up, eyes wide open, with a look of sheer terror. Hey, I said. Did we wake you up? Did you hear that? She said in a voice that did not sound anything like Rosa's voice. A cold shiver ran down my spine. Hear what? He's coming! Almost here! When he gets it, we're all over! We can't let him have it! Girl, said O'Brien, you're freaking us out. Who's coming, Spencer? She's dreaming, I said. One of my foster brothers used to do the same thing. Her eyes are open, but she's talking in her sleep. Right then, her eyes rolled way back into their sockets, revealing nothing but veiny white bulges. Did your foster brother do that too? Okay, I admitted. That is different. She slowly began to stand up, clutching the blanket to her chest, and then continued speaking in the same weird voice. Every living being will be transferred into a conduit of agony and suffering if he finds what he's looking for. You will all beg for death, but it will never come. An unfathomable horror of worlds, inconceivable, is at your gate. Do not open the door. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Is it a gate or a door? Fix your metaphors, creepy nightmare Rosa. O'Brien stood up and looked at me. Should I wake her? Right then, Rosa dropped her blanket, revealing that she was actually floating about eight or nine feet off the ground. Oh, we both said at the same time. It might have been a little bit of an overreaction to shoot Rosa with a taser gun, but then again, it might have been that there was no changing what already happened. Rosa fell into Jerry, waking them both up in a screaming fit of expletives and confusion. It took a good 20 minutes before Rosa was calmed down enough for us to pull the prongs out of her skin and get her patched up. We were all in front of the store, Rosa sitting on the counter while O'Brien put the finishing touches on her bandages. Why the hell would you shoot me with a taser? Always with the questions, Rosa. You were sleep floating, I explained. Oh, she said. Sorry about that, I, I didn't mean to. Hey guys, said Jerry. What do you suppose that is? He pointed at something just on the other side of the glass door that looked at first glance like a body slumped against it. On closer inspection, I became certain that it was, in fact, a body slumped against it. O'Brien drew her gun and carefully walked over, undid the lock, and opened the door just enough for the body to fall halfway into the gas station along with a freezing blast of wet air. Crap on a cracker, said Jerry. Is that Spencer? It was. He had a busted lip, swollen black eye, scrapes and bruises covering his face like he had gone ten rounds with a dump truck, but O'Brien was smart enough not to let her guard up. She kept one finger on the trigger while she checked for signs of breathing, which, sadly, she found. She put the unconscious Spencer in handcuffs, dragged him into the store, and then handed me another dollar before calling into the sheriff's office. Do you think this is going to be enough? I asked. One pair of handcuffs? He's unconscious and unarmed. What exactly did you have in mind? I said, I don't know, maybe we can tie him up. At the same time that Jerry blurted out, wooden stake through the heart. We compromised, found a roll of duct tape, and secured him to a rolling chair, then pushed the chair into the supply closet that then was nailed shut. Thirty minutes later, we heard the pounding on the roof. Slam! The first one jolted us all to high attention. We didn't have but maybe two seconds before the next. Slam! Maybe a tree branch had fallen over in a storm. Slam! 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 They started coming frequently, like a muffled machine gun. Slam! 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 What the hell is that? O'Brien bellowed. Slam! 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 They came together. Five to ten each second, and then... Just as suddenly as it started, the pounding on the roof came to an end. Maybe it was Hale, I suggested. Or maybe, offered Jerry, it was him. Escaping. He pointed at the room Spencer was in. Now, how does that make any sense? Asked O'Brien. Lady, we are way past the point of making any sense, he answered. Then added, I think you know that. That was all it took to convince O'Brien to pry the nails back out of the door to Spencer's makeshift prison, but once we got it open, we saw that he was still there. 
duct taped to the chair. We all breathed a collective sigh of relief before. Yeah, well, hey there, everyone. Spencer said with a sly smile. Merry Christmas. Now which of you wants to let me out of this chair? Spencer Middleton, said O'Brien. You're under arrest. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say... Christ, O'Brien, are we really going to do this again? Just set me free. Give me a weapon. You clearly have no idea what's out there right now. You think I did this to myself? Trust me. You're going to need my help. We probably should have gone with a steak. Spencer was still yelling at us as O'Brien closed the door again. Okay, she said. We need to check out what that noise was. Uh, no, no, we really don't, I responded. Rosa grabbed me by the arm for some reason, then said to the deputy, You can't leave us alone with this guy! Jeremy announced, I'll go check the noise. If I'm not back in five minutes, assume the worst. You're not going by yourself, snapped O'Brien. Fine, he said. Let's all go together. Rosa squeezed my arm tighter. I'd... I'd rather take my chances in here. Okay, said O'Brien near her wit's end. Then we split up. Are you freaking kidding me, I said. Are we really gonna Scooby-Doo this? Apparently, we Scooby were. And after a few more rounds of discussing, we Scooby did. It was decided that Jerry and I would go check out that noise while O'Brien and Rosa stayed and watched the prisoner. Hey, O'Brien told me just as we left on our wholly unnecessary suicide mission. I can handle Floaty Girl and Duct Tape Boy on my own, but you need to take this, just in case. I don't know why people are always trying to give me guns. I'm not a gun guy. Last time I had a gun, you know what? Don't even worry about the last time I had a gun. Plus, I need both hands just to move around. I'll take it, said Jerry. You ever fired a gun before? She asked. That depends, he answered. Are you a cop? She let out a defeated sigh and handed him her pistol. Try not to die, guys, okay? Rosa looked at us nervously and tried to offer some words of support. Be careful. I'd hate for this night to turn out to be a... What's the opposite of a sausage fest? Jerry answered, a clambery. Right. I'd, I'd hate for this to turn out to be a clambery. Jerry led the way with his two perfectly functioning legs pointing the gun and flashlight in front of him while he kicked a trail through the thick pile of snow that had settled knee-deep outside the gas station. We trudged through the frozen landscape until we were safely under the vehicle overhang next to the fuel pumps. Then he scanned the area with the light, revealing dozens of small holes in the fresh snow, like tiny baseball-sized craters. From here, he could see the roof of the gas station, as well as the piles of tiny winged creatures caught up in the gutters and slowly being swallowed by snow. I dug my own flashlight out of my coat pocket and scanned the area under the overhang, finding six or seven dead birds around the edges. It wasn't the first time I'd seen this, but it was the first time I know of where it happened right on top of the store. We get strange weather patterns out here, and every once in a blue moon, birds get confused and forget which way is up and fly straight into the ground in mass. Local scientists blame everything from fireworks to pesticides, but officially, the cause is unknown. All I know is that it's frickin' weird. Hey, check this out. I turned to see Jerry had plucked one of the creatures out of the snow and was holding it in his hands. Dude, don't touch that! It might have herpes! Look, he said, and pulled a long coil of copper wire out of the bird's corpse. I shrugged. But times are tough. He threw the bird back into the snow and wiped his hands on his pants. Should we go back inside? Yeah, in just a minute. But first, we need to talk. I really hate this part. Honestly, I'd rather face one of the creatures from the forest than have a serious chat with Jerry, but sometimes we don't get a choice. Fine. I'll come clean, he said. The mice were mine, but they were dead when I bought them. I, I used them for, for snake food. I, I didn't know. The radio, you, you put it back together? He blinked a few times and slowly pulled out his pack of Marlboros. So he put one in his mouth, slowly lit it, and took a drag, and then said, I really didn't have anything planned for this part, so I let his question hang there in the air for a minute. Did it say anything else? Oh, not much. Mostly about the snowstorm and... He trailed off. And... I asked. And it said that... Sagoth has risen. He took another drag. 
Are you sure you didn't say a savior has risen? Like some kind of Christmas thing? He said it like ten times in a row. Sagoth has risen. Sagoth has risen. You get the point. Sagoth has risen. Etc. I thought that it was kind of weird because I'd, I'd never heard him repeat anything before. We stood there in silence until he finished his cigarette. Then he looked back up at me. So, you ready to go back inside now? We both heard the sneeze at the same time. It came from somewhere down the road, leading into the forest. And if I could have jumped, I probably would have. What the hell was that? Jeremy said in a frantic whisper. It was a sneeze! Where's the gun? Jerry looked at the ground. I followed his eyes and pointed the flashlight at the blank spot in the snow next to the set of raccoon feet shaped prints leading off into the forest. I repeated the question slowly. Jeremy? Where is the gun? I set it down to pick up the dead bird. You don't think Rocco made off with it, do you? Rocco, our resident mutant trash panda. I highly, highly doubt that Rocco didn't steal it. We both looked at each other with that what do we do now look, and then Jeremy yelled out, Bless you! All well, the stupid ways I've imagined of dying at the gas station. This was not one of them. A voice called back from somewhere deep in the blizzard. Hello? Is anybody there? No! I yelled back. Huh. Sure sounds like somebody to me! The voice was getting closer. I tried to do some quick math. Could I run back to the gas station before the source of that voice reached us? Probably not. A figure started to emerge in the snowstorm. A man-shaped figure. As it got closer, the details came into focus, and before long, the man was underneath the awning with us, casually walking towards us, his hands in his pockets, snow covering his hooded blue jacket. He walked right up to us and asked if he could bum a smoke. I watched the guy light it up, take a drag, and notice that there was something strangely familiar about him. He was five foot ten, early thirties, dark brown eyes, short and well-maintained beard, thin but in good shape, and he was wearing a coat. It was way too big on him. After a few moments, he asked, You guys know if a gas station is open? His voice was tip of the tongue familiar. Yeah, there's no power, I answered, but the phone still works if you pay in advance. Who are you guys? You part of the emergency service crew or something? No. Uh, we work here. Uh, we got snowed in. No shit. I was driving through, I got stuck. I've been waiting in my car down the road for the past couple hours, but the engine just died. Thought I was going to freeze to death out here. We shook our hands, and we introduced ourselves before Jerry finally asked the question that was on my mind since we first saw the guy. Hey, uh, you aren't Donald Glover? He laughed. <laughs> yeah, I am. I knew it! We were standing outside talking to a famous actor-slash-director, Donald Glover, at my gas station! Holy shit, I said. What are you doing here? I was driving through, answered the Grammy Award-winning musical performer, Donald Glover. You were just driving through? On Christmas Eve? He shrugged. He got lost. I looked at Jerry, and then I looked back at primetime Emmy awardee Donald Glover, who asked, So, is it cool if I come inside and warm up? Of course! yelled Jerry before handing a spare flashlight to multiple Golden Globe winning writer slash comedian Donald Glover and leading the way back to the store. Once we were back inside, we introduced O'Brien and Rosa to five-time WGA award recipient Donald Glover, and I thought it was pretty cool. This was the second most famous person to ever step into the store. As, as if that really was Elvis that one time. But the girls were not impressed. In fact, they seemed more concerned about why we were returning without O'Brien's pistol. Jerry explained that we were attacked by a herd of ninjas. But O'Brien wasn't buying it. Before I could tell them about the birds, the store phone rang again. I was the closest, so I picked up while O'Brien gave Hollywood superstar Donald Glover a packing blanket to wrap up in. Hello, I said. The owner of the store was on the other end and let out an annoyed growl, then said, Jack, it's me. Benjamin? How many times have I asked you not to use my name on the phone? Oh, I'm sorry. It was Benjamin. <laughs> the crotchety bearded man that occasionally shows up at the gas station and shoots and blows things up. I would say more, but that's literally almost everything I know about him. What's going on over there? 
I'm looking at the weather reports right now, and the gas station looks like somebody opened up a portal to the center of the ninth circle of hell. Yeah, I said. Thanks for checking. By the way, I found your blog online. Oh? <laughs> yeah, what'd you think? I think you don't know the difference between a clip and a magazine. From here on out, I'd appreciate if you left me out of those little stories. Okay. I will. Um, are you going to be showing up this time? Thank you, Tori. I'm in Greece right now, looking for a status report. Something, uh, something beat the shit out of Spencer. Um, oh, and then we lost power again. Oh, uh, oh, by the way, uh, does Sagoth has risen mean anything to you? Sagoth! They asked the name of the shape-shifting demon. If he's anywhere near the gas station, you boys need to hunker down and pray, because that son of a bitch can look like anyone. Feeds off pain and leaves his victims stripped of all their skin. Oh, damn, I said. It's a good thing we found Donald Glover when we did. What followed was an agonizingly long pause. Hello? Did I lose you? Who the hell is Donald Glover? You know, the critically acclaimed musical genius. He performs under the pseudonym Childish Gambino. He's a rapper. He raps. Yeah, okay, I bet he's a great kisser, too. Jack, did you somehow become dumber since the last time I saw you? What do you mean? Motherfucker! I just Googled him! Donald Glover is at home with his family in Atlanta right now. You're in the presence of a shape-shifting demon! Well, maybe... The one in Atlanta is the double, and the real one is in the gas station. He made that growling noise again and said, mm, Only way to kill a demon like this is to take off his head. Goodbye! Dumbass! And the line went dead. Jeremy came and sat on the counter and said, All right, I'm not making any offers or anything. I just want to know your opinion. Do you think we're more likely or less likely to have an orgy now that Donald Glover is here? Jerry? Listen closely, I said in a low voice. We have to kill Donald Glover. Okay, he said, hopping back to his feet. Let's do it! How? Jesus. Didn't even need an explanation or anything. We, we need to cut off his head. Nice! Well, I... I had one ally on board. But I knew that convincing two more people to help us cover up yet another brutal murder at this gas station might be difficult. Assuming we could figure out a way to kill not Donald Glover, and also assuming that he really was a demon, and also assuming that demons are even real. Benjamin was feeding me true information, and none of this was just a vivid hallucination caused by a rapidly deteriorating mental state. Man... I lay it all out like that? It's a lot to take on faith before committing decapitation. I'm not sure how differently the night would have gone if Spencer's phone hadn't started ringing right then. And I'm also not sure how I keep forgetting that he has the only private cellular network on the planet that reliably gets service out here at the gas station. You guys hear that? Asked Not Donald. We all stood in a weird semicircle around him. And there was no possible way we didn't all hear the ringing noise coming from just behind the supply closet door. O'Brien and Rosa were between Not Donald and the supply closet, with Jerry and me on the opposite side. We had him surrounded. And if only I could somehow telepathically convey to the others that we needed to jump him now, while his guard was down, we might have a shot at incapacitating him while our skin was still intact. I don't hear anything, blurted Rosa between rings. She was probably the worst liar I had ever witnessed, but now that she had set the narrative, the others decided to commit. Yeah, me neither, said Jerry. Prob's just the wind. Donald, the demon, pointed at the supply closet and gave Jerry a raised eyebrow. You don't hear that? The ringing coming from right behind that door? No, said Jerry. Okay, what about you? He said to the deputy. Are you going to gaslight too? For some reason, O'Brien looked at me. I tried to make a hand gesture to say, He's a demon! We need to cut his head off! I think he just kind of confused the hell out of her. You should never play charades together. Yeah, it's nothing, she said. It's nothing? Why are you people being so weird right now? It was a scoffed and said, We're not being weird. You're the one acting weird. 
Okay, he said. A silent moment passed. Then, Demon Daniel pointed his flashlight right at O'Brien's eyes. She flinched for just a second, enough time for Demonold to dart past her to the supply closet door. Wait! I yelled, but it was too late. Demonold opened the door. What the hell is going on? He asked, pointing the flashlight at Spencer. O'Brien put up her hands and said, It's okay. I can explain. Spencer started shouting. Oh my god, please! Please help me! You've got to save me! These people are maniacs! They beat me and killed my wife! You have to get help! Rosa, bad liar. Spencer, freaking amazing liar. O'Brien yelled, Close the door! He took a step forward. Hey! Yelled Demonold. You stay back! You stay away from me! All of you! Please, untie me! She's not a real cop! They killed people! So many people! Spencer started crying. Like, real, actual crying. I couldn't help it. I started slow clapping. Everyone turned their flashlights to me except for Jerry, who was, well, clapping along. You got something to say? Asked the shapeshifter formerly known as Donald. Y yeah, uh, but how we don't turn this into a big, huge farce? How about we all come clean in the spirit of Christmas, okay? You're not really musical icon and famed television and movie star Donald Glover. You're really Sagoth, the shapeshifting demon. Do you have any idea how ridiculous you sound right now? Asked, hopefully, Sagoth. Yeah, I do, because I just said it. <sighs> These people, sobbed Spencer. They're crazy. Talking about demons and angels. They're killing people. There's something wrong with them. Please run, get help. Wait. Why was Spencer staying in character? I just told him that this was Sagoth. Why didn't he drop the act? Oh, unless... Sagoth wasn't the one that had beaten him senseless and left him propped up against the door? I felt a sudden pang of dread. The sensation was spiraling out of control way faster than I could keep up with. O'Brien attempted damage control. Everybody calm down. Donald, my name is Deputy Emilio O'Brien. You're a deputy? Yeah. And you think I'm a demon? No, of course not. But that guy does. He waved the flashlight at me, then pointed it at Spencer. And this guy right here? He's a wanted criminal. Okay, so that's why you beat him up and duct taped him to a chair and hit him in a dark closet? Is that something deputies do? Well, no, no, not exactly. But fuck this, I'm out! Before she could say anything, Donald? Question mark? Turned and ran out of the back door, letting another cold blast of freezing snow rush into the store before O'Brien raced out after him. The only sound in the room for the next minute was Spencer laughing. No, not laughing. Cackling. When he had finished, he said with a shit-eating grin, <laughs> This is getting fun. I wanted to run out after them. As stupid as it sounds, if I had been able to run, I would have. They were gone. And O'Brien was an adult who made her own decision. All I could do was wait. Time crept by slowly, waiting for her to return. Intrusive mental images of demons flaying my friend did not help. And neither did Spencer's comments. Hey, Rosa. She looked up. Shut up, I said. Let me just ask you one question. What exactly did Jack tell you about me, huh? Did he try to sell you that horse shit about me being some kind of sociopath? Rosa answered. The exact word he used was psychopath. Spencer laughed again. Nah, I've never hurt anyone before in my entire life. Came back out here for Jack. Worried about him. You know what he is, right? You know, what FFI does to your brain? Shouldn't be out here near other people, no. He needs to be in a hospital where he can't hurt anybody else. What do you mean, anybody else? I crutch walked over to Spencer and considered hitting him, but then decided against it for two reasons. First, that would have been embarrassingly ineffective. And second, it was obvious that that's what he wanted. He was trying to flip Rosa and prove that I was the bad guy. I don't know why I thought it was a good idea to engage in conversation. Do you have any idea how annoying it is to live with what you did to my leg? Yeah, I bet it's not half as bad as what you did to the folks you killed. Why don't we ask Kiefer, or ask about my old boss? Hey, I didn't kill your old boss! A second passed before he cracked a smile and I realized what I'd done. What about Kiefer? Asked a soft, nervous voice from behind me. Oh, I said, turning to Rosa. Yeah, well, him either. Yeah, I didn't kill anybody. Let me ask you a question, Jack. You know. Because you're in such an honest mood right now. Whatever happened to Carlos? Huh? 
I've been sitting here in the dark all night, and I can't shake this weird thought. Am I the only one who wants to know why Carlos isn't here? I looked at Jerry and said, Put him in the cooler. We wheeled the psychopath into the walk-in, double-checked that the duct tape was secure, then closed the door and propped a chair up against the handle. He could scream to his tiny black heart's content in there. It wouldn't bother us. Ten minutes more passed before O'Brien returned to the store. <sighs> he got away, she said as she dusted the snow off her jacket. Jerry shattered a glass beer bottle against the wall and pointed the jagged fragment at her, yelling, Nice try, demon! She glared at him and said, If you come near me with that thing, you better be ready to use it, because either I'm going down or you are. He's right, I said. What? asked Rosa and O'Brien at the same time. O'Brien was alone out there with Sagoth. For how long? We have no idea if you're really you anymore. Jack... Okay, I think you're confused. Rosa raised her hand and said, Why don't we just ask you something that only the real O'Brien would know? Yeah, good idea, said Jerry. Is Jack circumcised? Dude! How the hell would I know that? She screamed. Jerry looked at me, then back at her, then back at me. Oh, were you two not? Oh, I'm sorry. I think I totally misread that whole situation. Remind me to kick your ass later, she said, taking the words right out of my mouth before pointing her flashlight at the empty supply closet. Where's Spencer? I explained that he was trying to get into our heads. We had no choice but to put him in there. It was self-defense. Amazingly, she didn't disagree. It took a minute for the situation to calm down, but eventually, Jerry lowered his bottle knife and agreed that we would all just keep an eye on one another until daylight. And backup came. I lit the last of our candles and placed them all around the store, then got O'Brien alone in a corner. Jerry was still eyeballing us pretty hard, so I whispered quietly, There's something I think you need to see. What is it? She whispered back. I can't say exactly. Okay, I need to show you. Okay. Where is it? I need Spencer's phone. Let me guess. It's still on him? I nodded. In the midst of Spencer's mind games, I forgot to steal his cell phone again. I definitely didn't love the idea of opening the cooler door. Every time I think of Spencer, I convince myself that he's figured out a way to escape, and he's just a few seconds from falling down on me from the ceiling like an evil Spider-Man. I'll be right back, she said. I followed as close behind as possible as she went to the cooler and pulled the chair back. What is she doing? Asked Jerry in an atypical voice that I would call concerned if it was coming from anyone else. We didn't answer. Instead, O'Brien opened the door, pointed the flashlight at the still smiling Spencer, and walked up to him. I waited until she had put her flashlight on a shelf and reached her hand into Spencer's pocket before I sprung into action, slamming the cooler door shut and pushing the chair back into place. I could hear her muffled scream and slams against the other side of the metal door. I'm sorry, I whispered. Dude, what the hell? I leaned my back against the cooler and looked at the shocked faces of Jerry and Rosa. And I made a mistake? If that really is O'Brien, then we'll know in a few hours when help arrives. If it isn't, we've got the demon exactly where we need it. What demon? screamed the ever-inquisitive Rosa. When did you start talking angels and demons? I'm willing to give the benefit of the doubt, but a, a person has their limits. All I know is that you've been acting strange all night, and then your friend shot me with a taser in my sleep, and then you come with this guy that, that you're all fanboying over so hard I expect you to start drinking his bath water, and then out of nowhere you start saying he's a demon? Well, when you put it like that, sure. I guess this does look bad. Where's the gun, huh? You two go outside, and then Jerry loses the gun. How do we know that you didn't take it? Yeah, yelled Jerry. How do we know that you didn't take it? I gave him my coldest stare. I want you to let O'Brien out of the cooler right now, please. She crossed her arms and started tapping her foot. I, I can't do that. Why not? She called me Jack. So? Yeah, echoed Jerry. So what? So she never calls me Jack. She calls me Crutches, or Weirdo Boy, or some other slightly insensitive pet name. I, I've never heard her call me Jack before. Hmm, said Jerry. He does make a compelling point. Rosa screamed, Shut up! 
It was too late. Spencer had put the roots of doubt into Rose's mind, and there was nothing I could say that would get her back on board. Fortunately for me, I didn't have to say anything, because right then, the front doors opened and O'Brien walked in. He got away, she said as she dusted the snow off her jacket. Jerry shattered another glass beer bottle against the wall and pointed the jagged fragment at her, yelling, Nice try, demon! She glared at him and said, If you come near me with that thing, you better be ready to use it, because either I'm going down or you are. How did you get out? Rosa stammered. Get out of what? She asked. Oh, check it out. Jerry said to the room. It's Rosa's first time witnessing something paranormal. Let's see how she reacts. O'Brien put up her hands and said, What the hell are you talking about? And why is there a chair next to the cooler? And where is the duct tape boy? Rosa fainted. And as strange as this sounds, probably a good thing that she wasn't conscious for this next part. Did you ever hear the one about the guy who thought that a fireman was an arsonist? Admittedly, it's not a very good joke. And even if it were... I'm awful at delivery. People usually think I'm trying to be funny when I'm not, and same for the other way around. But at any rate, the punchline is something to the effect of every time there's a fire, he's there. Feel free to forget the joke if you want to. Not important, just something I was thinking about. Well, Jerry covered Rosa with a blanket and made every attempt to keep her comfortable while I tried to explain the situation to O'Brien. Wait, so you're telling me that there's an evil doppelganger inside that cooler? Yeah. And... How do you know that's what it is? A magic radio and a monster hunter told us? No, I just do. I need more to go on than that. Okay, please, just don't go into the cooler until after help has arrived. You can wait a few more hours, right? I could see the gears turning in her head, and I had to wonder if she thought I was crazy. Or if she was about to rip off our flesh and feed on our suffering. Surely, if this actually were the shapeshifter, there wouldn't be any better opportunity to start picking us off. Two of us were locked in the cooler, one of us was unconscious, I'd never been much of a fighter, even with all my limbs. And Jerry was... Well... Jerry. Obviously, she didn't kill and eat me, so I was forced to assume that this really was the original O'Brien, and the one in the cooler was the double. But my confidence level, in anything, reality included, had hit zero and started digging a long time ago. A pair of headlights lit up the room and we both looked outside at the snow truck pulling into the parking lot. I couldn't believe it. The cavalry was early! In my experience, anything can happen at the gas station, but seriously, that never happened! The cavalry was Saul Berthelot, the retired school bus driver and owner-operator of the only snowplow in town. He must have had plans for Christmas because people around here aren't exactly known for finishing ahead of schedule. And especially on the taxpayer dime, but I'd take my miracle where I can get them in these days. Saul pulled up next to Pump 2, honked a couple times, and waved at me. O'Brien stated the obvious. I think this Jagoff wants you to turn on the pump. Come on, he knows the pumps don't work without electricity, doesn't he? I'm guessing he doesn't. None of us wanted to open the door and go back into the freezing cold. But when the pumps hadn't magically switched on after a few seconds... Saul decided that it would be a good idea to lean on the horn until somebody came out to help him. O'Brien pulled out her car keys and started for the door. Where are you going? I asked, stumbling after her and trying my best not to make it sound like I suspected that she might be on her way to kill him and strip him of his flesh. I was going to help him on his way, if that's alright with you, Jack. I suddenly felt very small. It's bad enough not being able to trust my own eyes, or memories, or mine. It's so much worse not being able to trust my friends. Hang on a second, Jerry said before O'Brien pushed the door open. You just called Jack, uh, Jack. Yes, so? She asked. Jerry looked at me and waved his hands in the air. Your entire basis for locking the other O'Brien in the cooler was that she called you Jack. O'Brien shook her head at me. I called you Jack all the time. It's your name, dumbass. Don't open the door. Behind Jerry... Rosa was floating with her eyes rolled back into pupilless white bulges. He looked back at her and casually said, Oh, snap! She's floating again. It's not safe! Something has found you! It's waiting! Hungry! Outside! She slowly started to rise into the air by a few more inches until Jerry grabbed her around the waist. I'm gonna have to tie her to a chair or a doorknob or something. Do you remember where Benjamin left all the paracord? There's something on the roof! I looked her in the... Uh... Eye... 
area and asked, Now, is this like a metaphorical something on the roof? You fools! There's something on the roof! With that, Rosa pointed out the glass doors up at the covered awning over the gas pumps, and the thing, leaning over the edge, stared down at the snowplow. What followed is actually pretty difficult to describe. See, when I saw it, the three of us had a shared memory, a visceral animal reaction, like a, like a nut punch to the soul. Before that instant, I had seen some things, like truly bizarre things, that many people may have considered horrific. My own exposed bones, uh, a clan of nudist zombies, um, a snake and spider hybrid. I could keep on with the list of things all day, but my point is, after this, I'm going to have to completely re-examine my concept of horrific. The very image of the creature, which is not even the right word for it, if human language is capable of one, was something that eyes were never meant to see. It forced our minds way past fight or flight into some third option, like my brain simply gave up and shat its pants. We all said it at the same time. Fuck! Fuck! Rosa fell into Jerry's arms with her eyes closed, and he dropped her onto the ground like a sack of dog food. We were all transfixed at the horrendous beast on the ledge of the pump awning. Its head was the size of a beach ball, shaped more or less like an enormous skull. The eyes were sunken charcoal pockets that didn't appear to move in time or relation with the rest of its body, sort of like balls of smoke. Two nostril slits above an open mouth filled with disorganized rows of serrated chalk white teeth like those of a shark, each one about the size of my thumb. It had two spinal horns, both at, at least a yard in length and then its shiny black marble in appearance. It, the thing's clawed hands were tipped in jagged talons, blacker than black, and its skin resembled that of a third-degree burn, pinkish deposits of scar tissue glued upon layers of giant ropey muscle. Even more interesting was that we could see the beast in all of its monstrous glory outlined against the sky. Even though there was no light out there other than the ones on the snowplow, our eyes were picking up a whole new wavelength outside of the normal visual spectrum. It was all coming from this thing. Three-way jinx. Temporarily snapping the rest of us back to reality and all likelihood saving us from losing what left of our minds. O'Brien fell to the ground and started violently barfing. Hey! yelled Saul from inside the truck. You guys got any gas left or what? At first, I didn't want to look back out those doors. I had to. Saul was about to do something that he had no idea would be the single worst mistake of his life. I feel I should tell you maybe just like a little bit more about Saul. When I was still too young to drive, I would have to walk half a mile every morning to my area school bus pickup spot at 5.30 a.m. My house was close to Saul's hunting camp, where he parked the school bus, so that meant that I was always the first on the bus route, and if I was ever late, he would leave without me. But depending on how hungover he is, he might not start driving until 6.30 or 7, which meant that I would have to stand there in the middle of a dirt field next to the road for up to an hour, an hour and a half, at the point of each day when mosquitoes were waking up. After his wife left him, he became a much more intolerable drunk, and his kids would show up to school with bruises and broken teeth. He would spend hours at the gas station sometimes, refilling the same cup of coffee over and over, droning on to anyone that would listen to him about what new group of people he had decided was ruining the country. One time, his name came up on the transmission. There is a man, Saul Berthelot. He cries alone in Deerstand. His blood alcohol content is 0. 0.3110. He owns 42 firearms. His favorite color is purple. I guess my point, um, if I even have one, is that Saul is a shitty bus driver. And a shitty husband. And, and father. Shitty customer. Shitty person. But a shitty hunter, too. He was a lot like most people in this town, actually. But even still, I did not want to watch him get his skin ripped off. I got to the front door and pushed them open at the same time Saul was stepping out of his snow truck. I screamed, STAY INSIDE YOUR VEHICLE! Either Saul hadn't heard me, or he decided to ignore it, choosing instead to down the rest of his 40-ounce snatty light before tossing it into the snow. Saul, go back to your truck! There's a gas leak or something! 
He was a couple yards from his truck when he looked at me and yelled back, Fuck you, I need to take a piss! The creature lurched forward from the edge of the awning, reaching its left arm down with the speed of a mousetrap and snatched Saul into the air by his feet. The beast pulled Saul, dangling upside down, screaming and cursing close to its mouth. Saul was extremely lucky that he always kept a loaded pistol tucked into his pants. Not because it helped him survive the situation. No, he died. Like, so much dead. But at least the pistol saved him from what could have been a feast of agony for the thing on the awning. Which I had deduced by now was actually the real demon's soga. He popped off a couple of rounds into the demon's face, but the mortal weapon was ineffective as a bee sting, and all it did was piss the demon off enough to slam Saul full force against the concrete pavement below. When he picked the man back up, his broken body dangled lifelessly in the monster's hands. With its other hand, it poked at Saul a few times, then with one of its talons, opened the man up and spilled his blood out into the snow. As far as last words go, fuck you, I need to take a piss. Or Probably not the ones you want on your tombstone. Uh, I felt myself being yanked backwards by my shirt collar and tossed onto the floor of the gas station before O'Brien closed and locked the door. Yeah, nice. Lock the door. Deadbolt will be sure to stop the 20-foot-tall demon creature from coming inside. She pulled me to my feet and said one word. Weapons. We stayed as far away from the door as possible while we turned the place inside out looking for whatever we could use to defend ourselves, but it was seriously slim pickings. Broken glass shards, chair legs, pair of spare crutches, three pocket knives. We didn't have what it took to kill the thing outside if it wanted us to. I can't believe he's dead, lamented O'Brien as she collected a few bottles of our more flammable liquor. It was like that. Well, Jerry answered as he duct taped a pocket knife to the edge of a chair leg. He died doing what he loved. Shooting stuff. O'Brien shook her head in disgust. Jerry caught the gesture and asked, Oh, I'm sorry. Were you and Rando close? Dude, they said. I know tensions are high because it's Christmas and all, but read the room. A man just died. So what? said Jerry defensively. Somebody dies every 600 milliseconds. We can't focus if we have to grieve every single one of them. Are we really going to pretend that any of us are broken up about that red shirt? If we can be perfectly honest for a second, the value of human life out here at the gas station is grossly over-exaggerated, and out of the six people inside this building, Rosa is probably the only one of us that hasn't killed anybody. He stared at me and O'Brien, daring us to call him out on that. We all just stood still, trying to think of what to say. But there really wasn't anything to say. For all his faults... Jerry could be very Jerry-ish sometimes, and it was easy for me to forget that when I first met him and he was trying to get me to join a murder cult. Well, I said finally, it's only her first day. We allowed ourselves a short awkward laugh before going back to hunting for weapons. I can't say exactly how much time had passed, but the three of us were ripping open every box in the supply closet when we heard Rosa say, hey guys. What happened? We looked back and saw her standing in the doorway, pointing Saul's revolver at the floor. Where'd you get that? asked O'Brien. I saw this thing sitting there on the ground outside. Did you guys know there's a snow truck out there? How did you get it? O'Brien asked, even though I think we all knew the answer. I just walked outside and picked it up. Why? The annoyance in her voice had ticked up a notch. Don't do that again. Why not? The annoyance in her voice had ticked up a couple more notches. Don't worry about it. Jerry jumped in with, You don't, you didn't happen to see a terrifyingly huge hell monster while you were out there, did you? She squinted at him and said, No. Why did you lose one? O'Brien reached out and snatched the gun from her. Hey! Sorry, I didn't feel like explaining to everyone why I'm the only one here that should have a gun right now. Well, that's fair. I wasn't even mad. I was, however, mad at the plan that she laid out next. Desperate times call for desperate measures. And there was one resource that we had purposefully neglected to tap before now. Whatever was left inside the cooler, we were going to need help fighting the thing outside. And whether I liked it or not, Spencer was a survivor. O'Brien checked the revolver to see that we had four bullets left. That would almost certainly not be enough if we needed it. The deputy opened the door, gun in hand, while the rest of us stood close behind, holding flashlights. 
Our job was to collectively point them into the eyes of anybody or anything that might try to jump out at us. It came to that. We didn't know what to expect when we opened the door, but the first thing we saw was the empty chair that Spencer had been duct taped to. Hello? Is anyone in Is anyone alive in here? After a few seconds with no response, she stepped into the cooler, and I immediately regretted going along with his plan. Spencer flew in from next to the cooler door, hooked an arm around O'Brien's gun hand, and spun her into the wall. The gun clacked to the ground, and we all tried pointing our flashlights at him, but he was just way too friggin' fast. He planted a solid boot into Jerry's solar plexus, sending him crashing into the wall across from the cooler door, snatched a handful of Rosa's hair, yanked her into the cooler with him. Before O'Brien could even stand up, Spencer had Rosa in a chokehold with the pencil that he had used for inventory counts pressed tightly against her neck. You guys get bored without me or something? He taunted. I kept my flashlight trained on him as he slowly backed into the cooler. The deputy's handcuffs were still around his wrist, but the chain had been snapped. And now it was nothing more than a pair of fancy bracelets. Dude? Listen, I started. Shut up! He yelled. Here's how this is gonna work. First, crack! Spencer released Rosa and fell to the ground, his head colliding with the floor and bouncing. Behind him... Ah, oh, shit, not this again. Spencer... Holding the weapon he had just bludgeoned the other Spencer with, the same flashlight that the O'Brien double had taken into the cooler, and I was just starting to realize the same exact flashlight I had given to Donald Glover earlier that night. Damn, said Spencer, the conscious one. Is that what I look like? I'm one sexy motherfucker. The expression on his face changed once he spotted something in the cooler floor. I followed his eyes to where he was looking and saw it. Saul's revolver. O'Brien leapt for it at the same time as Spencer, and they both collided before reaching it. They were flying into the shell, O'Brien catching most of the impact, and I dove into the cooler, finding the disgusting sticky ground and feeling around in the dark until my hands felt something cold. A heavy piece of metal. I pointed it at Spencer. But there was no way I was going to get a clear shot, especially with Rosa's wild flashlight job. Spencer threw O'Brien into the rolling chair, and she flipped over it onto the floor. He wiped a bead of blood from his face and took a step towards me. But that's as far as he made it before another body jumped out of the dark and tackled him from the side. Well, here's where things get even more confusing. Pencil Spencer landed on top of Flashlight Spencer, started punching him hard, but not hard enough. In no time, Flashlight Spencer had slammed his flashlight into Pencil Spencer's fist, then flipped him onto his back and started wailing on him. I had my gun aimed right at them both, completely not sure what to do. I looked at O'Brien and said, I don't know which one's the real Spencer. Who fucking cares? She yelled back. Shoot them both! Flashlight Spencer stopped punching. He and Pencil Spencer both looked at me and said, Huh? I hesitated. Pencil Spencer stabbed the pencil into Flashlight Spencer's shoulder and twisted. Flashlight Spencer winced and jumped off him. Right then, Jerry called out from the cooler doorway, Hey, butt brain! He was holding a lit Molotov cocktail. Not for long, before I had time to scream, Bad idea! He had pitched the damn thing at Flashlight Spencer. You caught it in his fucking hand. Just when I thought things couldn't get any crazier, Pencil Spencer punched the still-burning weapon hard enough to shatter it into a blue fireball that lit up the entire room for just a moment before burning out and leaving us all in the dark trying to catch our breaths. Rosa pointed her flashlight at the figure running out of the cooler. The Spencer ran right through Jerry like he was made out of balloons, then disappeared out the back door. After a couple of seconds, we collectively remembered that there was still a Spencer in the room and pointed our flashlights around to find him. I looked at where he just was, finding nothing but specks of blood and broken shelves. Then I pointed at O'Brien. Then Rosa, who was sitting on the ground, pointing a flashlight at me. Then the other Rosa, who was sitting right next to her, holding an identical flashlight. The Rosas both crawled quickly to the opposite sides of the cooler, and then stared at one another with the exact same look of frozen shock, while O'Brien stood between them and spoke. All right, here's the deal. One of you is a shapeshifter. That's the one I'm talking to right now. We didn't come in here to hurt you. We came in here because we need your help. There's something outside the gas station that just killed a man. I watched both of their faces and instantly knew. One looked up at O'Brien and asked in a soft voice, Somebody died? The other waited, about a second too late to mimic the look of fear and concern on Rosa's face. I walked right over to the shapeshifter and said, You're busted. She looked at me with a sweet little, what did I do, look. But it wasn't fooling me. And then, 
The look changed into a wry smile, and she chuckled. Hi. What can I do? You got me. So, I started, who is Sagoth? She got to her feet and answered. Oh, I don't doubt you've got a ton of questions, but I don't have the time to desire to answer them. This has been a nice distraction, but if what you say is true, I need to get to work. You can't... You could have escaped any time you wanted, I surmised. Well, yeah, but you humans are such curious creatures, and I needed something to do to pass the time until Sagoth showed up. Well, I'll be off. And when you wake up, you won't remember any of this. The double waved his hands, and Brian, Jerry, and Rosa Prime all fell to the floor unconscious. I looked at each of them, just trying to make sure that they were still breathing. Then back at the mimic Rosa in front of me. Well, that certainly is strange. But this time, but it's time for you to go to sleep. She waved her hands again. I blinked a couple more times. What? I don't sleep, I said back. I thought I told you that. You may have told Rosa, but I can't copy memories, Jack. Just voices and faces. Now, who are you? I, I really don't have time for... I pointed the revolver at her and squeezed the trigger. Okay, hold on. I know that sounds bad, but I'm sure you moral absolutists out there are probably thinking to yourselves, I would not have done that if I were in this situation. Well, you know what? You weren't. I was, and I was actually pretty pissed off, not just because the asshole had been screwing with us, using us as bait to lure out the real demon and, like, letting us all go super paranoid on one another this whole time, but also because after all this, after everything I'd been through, that night, he announced that I was going to be the only one to remember any of it. <laughs> Besides, I had already worked out that a bullet to the chest wasn't going to kill it. Ah! It screamed, immediately transforming into O'Brien before my eyes. Why would you do that? All I wanted to do was help you! But if I had to kill you to get to Sagoth, I will! And you're not- I shot again, aiming for the center mass like Benjamin always said. The creature immediately transformed into Jerry. It smiled, and I shot again. And that's when it turned into someone else. It turned into her. She who shall not be named. The girl that would haunt my dreams if I was capable of having any. The creature looked at me with her green eyes and asked, Well, are you going to shoot me again? I sighed and lowered the gun. What's the point? It changed one last time. And then I was standing in my own presence. And I gotta say, I didn't realize how rough I was starting to look. I desperately needed a haircut. The circles under my eyes had their own shadows. My cheekbones were getting more pronounced, and I was even skinnier than I looked in the mirror. Jack, I'm gonna tell you something I've never told any human before. It's me. Your kind are a lot like hamsters. Yeah, I don't feel compelled to explain my actions or motivations to people because you're so primitive and unevolved that you simply couldn't wrap your tiny mind around it. Okay, I said, that's fair. There's no such thing as demons. Say, Goth, is my responsibility. Okay? He sleeps inside of one of the wrinkles in your universe, but something has woken him up. Something I even I don't know. Every century or so, I have to put him back to sleep, which is why I'm here. Okay, not to hurt you, but to help you. Benjamin... In case you're hearing this right now, you were wrong. Again. Also, fuck you. The legend states, A long time ago, of demons, people saw a shapeshifter every time Sagoth awoke and feasted. Before long, humans confused us. Oh, I see. Firefighter. I'm gonna stop Sagoth from destroying your world now, Jack. But before I do, there's one last piece of information I want to leave with you. When I take somebody's form... I don't see memories, but I can feel what's inside them. In a lack of better terms, I'm what you call an empath, okay? You and your friends here are all kinds of messed up. You'd need an army of psychologists to untangle the mental slinkies inside your mind. Okay, thanks. That's not what I'm trying to say. Your fucked up brains aren't all that special. But the other one, Spencer, I looked inside of him and I saw all I saw was like... Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Same as I see when I look at a, a table or a rock. Just a black void. Yeah, I responded. I actually knew that. I took a step back and let my doppelganger walk out of the cooler. And then right out the front doors. The rest of the night passed on without incident. The others slept where they fell. But I tried to make them comfortable with blankets and pillows made out of bags of stale bread. While the sun came up, I cleaned. 
enough to fill four contractor bags. And then I started writing up the inventory loss slip for everything that had been damaged in the fights. It's amazing how productive you can be when you don't sleep. After everything was back in order, I sat in my chair behind the register and read for an hour or so while the others slept off whatever the shapeshifter had done to them. Our first customer walked into the store a little while after that. I didn't bother looking up for my book because I had already posted a sign on the door that said we didn't have any electricity and couldn't sell gas or run cards or accept cash, and nothing worked. I added my own festive touch to the bottom, the drawing of a Christmas tree. The customer walked up to the counter and interrupted my book right when it was finally starting to get interesting. Excuse me. You have any band-aids? I looked up from my book and I saw the man standing there was Spencer fucking Middleton, complete with a pencil still sticking out of his shoulder. I quickly reached for the gun, which I had left on the counter, and realized it wasn't even there anymore. Spencer lifted the revolver and asked, Was this what you're looking for? Feels a little light. You think you were going to take me out with the first shot? I slowly dog-eared my page and placed the book on the counter before asking, is there any way you're actually just a shapeshifter? Spencer shook his head. A minute later, we were back outside in the knee-deep snow behind the gas station. Spencer dug the barrel of the gun into my back and walked me towards the woods. When we got there, he yelled, STOP! He looked around, smelling the air, smiling, and pulled a long knife out of his sheath on his belt. Yeah, this'll work. Are you left-handed or right-handed? Why? I asked. Never mind. He grabbed my left hand and sliced my pinky clear off, and then grabbed both of my crutches and yanked them away from me. I hit the thick blanket of snow and hugged my rapidly bleeding hand wound against my stomach. The hot, wet liquid pouring out felt strangely comforting as it warmed my torso. It's nothing personal. Yeah, I just need some bait. Got a new boss now. He wants me to bag and tag something special. Do me a favor. Keep on bleeding. Won't take long for the thing to catch your scent. For what it's worth, this thing doesn't kill you. I'll let you live. He turned and began to walk away. Hey, Spencer! I yelled after him. He stopped. Yeah! You're a dick. He laughed and walked back into the gas station carrying my crutches under his arm. I laid on my back looking up at the sky and hearing the familiar sound of that gas station door closing, followed by the familiar scraping noise of the deadbolt going into place. If I was going to give survival the old college try, it would have to be now or never. I pushed myself along with my good hand and leg, leaving a sloppy trail of bloody snow behind me. Maneuvering in my condition was going to be difficult, to say the least, but I could sense that my vision was beginning to tunnel, which for me is a particularly bad prospect. If I lose consciousness, well, it means I'm dead. I managed to pull myself all the way to the side of the gas station before I finally decided that this was a waste of time. I wasn't getting inside, and even if I did, Spencer would just pull me right back out. There was something left to do but hope for one more miracle. Hey, Jack. What are you doing out here? I looked up to see my old friend Tom, with his white hair perfectly matching the snowy landscape. Tom was the first deputy that they sent out to babysit us, the first one to die. I squeezed my bloody nub against my armpit to try and slow the bleeding as I worked out if I was looking at a ghost, a hallucination, or the shapeshifter, and realized that I generally couldn't tell. Spencer's using me for bait? Tom instantly morphed into a seven-foot-tall, 400-pound Samoan covered in scars and tribal tattoos. That limited the options down to hallucination or shapeshifter. That punk is back! He barked. Yeah? Well, I guess I need to teach him a lesson about- He stopped and turned back to the woods. Something out there was crunching loudly through the forest, snapping through the branches and causing a hell of a lot of noise as it approached. The Samoan figure crouched next to me and whispered, Sorry. Looks like we don't have time to get out of here. Sagoth has smelled your blood and now he's coming for you. Oh, that sucks. Listen to me very closely. There's one thing you need to know about Sagoth. He has one weakness, and that is this. He cannot hurt you if you do not look at him. Do you understand? No. Close your eyes. No matter what happens, no matter what you hear, keep your eyes shut until you hear me say the words, Salute him! Till then, he'll do everything he can to trick you into opening your eyes. Once you do that, all bets are off. 
You'll start with your eyelids. Do you understand? Still no? Shapeshifter sighed and said, Close your eyes! Right then, I saw it. Sagoth. Pushing his way through the forest, he stood as tall as the trees, horrendous and humanoid, with an aura of inconceivable terror and a face that screamed all things dark and hateful. I shut my eyes and instantly felt blessed relief. It's okay, said a sweet, gentle voice. You can look now. It's safe. He will do everything he can to trick you to open your eyes. Um, no, that's okay, I said. From behind me, I heard O'Brien screaming, Jack, help me! I have to do better than that. All at once, I felt them crawling all over me. Insects, they chirped and squeaked as they flooded my pant legs and under my clothes and even into my nose, ears, and mouth. I gagged and swatted at them, but still pressed my eyes shut as hard as I could. A burning heat blasted across my face. I heard the giant being scream from inches away, Maggot, open your eyes and behold your damnation! Uh, no thanks, I yelled back, and then he brought the big guns. The next thing I knew, I was falling. There was no earth beneath me, only air whipping past my skin as I plummeted down, down, down. It's a good thing I'm still a coward because I think squeezing my eyes shut in a situation like that was actually my natural reaction. And after falling for what felt like ages, I finally landed on a warm ocean. This was about to get really tough. I kicked and screamed at the water around me with no idea which way was up or down. I was certain that I was about to drown, but still I kept my eyes shut. Eventually, I could feel myself rising. The air left in my lungs was maybe possibly enough to pull me to the surface. I held off for as long as I could until my lungs ached with a pain that was almost as bad as death, and still I had not broken the surface. This was it. The moment I would finally die. But if I had to go, I wasn't going to give that douchebag demon the satisfaction of knowing that he'd beaten me. I kept my eyes shut, put up two middle fingers, and took a deep breath of water. Which, of course, turned out to be air. And as soon as I inhaled, I was transported back to the snow-covered patch of dirt next to the gas station, completely dry and still freezing to death. The air suddenly reeked of boiled eggs, and a girl's voice said into my ear, Salute him. You can open your eyes, Jack. Say Goth is back where he belongs. I cautiously opened one eyelid and looked at the amazingly beautiful woman standing beside me and asked her, So... He's gone? For now. It's interesting. Most people crack at spiders and look, but you got all the way to the ocean. I, I don't expect this to mean much to you, but I'm actually impressed. A metal pole erupted from out of the center of her chest. She fell to her knees and coughed up copious amounts of blood. She looked down at the thing with a bewildered expression and fell over onto her side. The pole was thin like an arrow, covered in serrated hooks and once she hit the ground, I could see that it was actually a spear. The other end of it protruded from her back with a black cord connected to it, running all the way across the yard to the feet of Spencer Middleton. He dropped the harpoon gun and whistled to himself as he walked the distance to where the shapeshifter was still gagging, still twitching, and grabbing onto the pole that impaled her. As he came closer, she started changing. From one form to another, a giant bodybuilder, an Olympic-style wrestler, a morbidly obese man, a child, Jerry, O'Brien, me, Spencer, and then it started switching faster and faster, ten different people each second, all of them holding onto the spear and bleeding out into the snow. He went through a hundred of them before finally stopping and settling on that of a frail, old Asian woman. Tiny and wrinkled, more white hair than black. Huddled in a fetal position, his tears rolled down the side of her nose into the snow. Something told me that if the shapeshifter had a true form, I was looking at it. Struggle all you want, Spencer said to her. This spear is tungsten. You can't pull it out or break it. I own you. And in a minute, dead or alive, I'm going to sell you. He grabbed her around the neck and dragged her away. All I could do was watch them go. She connected eyes with me until Spencer had dragged her around the side of the gas station. And then, that was it. I was alone. I couldn't move anymore. Even breathing was beginning to become a near impossible task. I thought about how strange this was going to look to Jerry or O'Brien or whoever was going to be unlucky enough to find me out here, clutching my four-fingered hand under my armpit and staring into the forest. The blood in the snow was already being erased under a slow flurry of snowflakes, and after an hour or less, 
it would look like none of this had ever happened. People knew I had mental issues, so this wouldn't even be front page news. The only curiosity will be, I wonder what happened to his finger. Oh well. There are certainly worse ways to go, especially in a world with monsters like Sagoth and Spencer. I watched the snowflakes fall and focused all my effort on the labor of drawing in one last breath. And one more. And then one more after that. It might be pointless, but I'm going to get my last few seconds. And then the back door opened and somebody came over to my side, grabbed me by the shirt collar and started dragging me. He dragged me through the back hall and instantly I felt the blood rushing through my veins all over again. He took me all the way to the front of the store and dropped me onto my back before crouching down next to me and smiling. I told you I'd let you live if I caught what I wanted. And a deal's a deal. Right? I took a deep breath of warm air and tried to find the right words to tell Spencer just how much I hated him, but I couldn't. He didn't seem to need me to anyway. You know, Jack... Maybe things aren't meant to change. Maybe things are the way they are for a reason. I mean, it's been up and down for both of us. We've both lost so many friends here at the gas station. Kiefer, Carlos, Tom, that hunter asshole from this morning. But, at the end of the day, only two things are constant. You and me. You're like that shitty Batman to my awesome Joker. And don't worry about the shapeshifter. Just hand it over to my new boss. So, she won't be bothering you anymore. He stared out the doors at something, something I couldn't see. Smiled big, smug, self-satisfied. Yeah, you're right. Some things never change. How you never remember that I can pick your pockets. Hey, Spencer? I said as soon as my voice had come back to me. Yeah? He said. I'm right-handed. <laughs> I stuck the tip of the revolver into his stomach and pulled the trigger. The look on his face was that of... Oh, I cannot believe that shit just happened. He fell onto his ass and looked at the gun in my hand. And then the rapidly growing circle of blood on his shirt. You little piece of shit. O'Brien finally fuckingly woke up and ran out of the cooler into the front room yelling, What was that noise? Jack, are you okay? Spencer grabbed his stomach and bolted out the front door. I tried to yell to O'Brien to go after him, but I had lost the ability to talk again. And instead, I just closed my eyes and waited. So I got to ride in an ambulance, which is pretty cool. I also got to take Christmas Day off of work, which is about the closest thing to a Christmas miracle I can get, so I'll take it. The others all came and visited me at the hospital in shifts. No, well, I mean, somebody had to stay and watch the gas station. And I even got to eat, like, ten packs of chocolate pudding. There's a nurse here that I suspect has a thing for me because she keeps sneaking me extra desserts. Once again, the official report is that nothing supernatural happened. Saul's disappearance, my beating, and the damage to the gas station and all the blood were blamed on Spencer. The others have absolutely no recollection of the night, and I'm left with no proof besides my notoriously shaky memory, which is why I decided to write it all down before I forgot anything. All in all, it wasn't the worst Christmas I've ever had. On Christmas Day, the nurse brought me a neatly gift-wrapped box. I asked who it was from. She just smiled and said somebody special had dropped it off for me. I unwrapped and opened it to find another, smaller box. I unwrapped that one and found another box. And inside that box, an another smaller box. And the last one was small enough to fit inside of the palm of my hand. Someone had gone through a lot of trouble for this and I was starting to get a very uneasy feeling. Finally opened that last box, and it confirmed my suspicion. Inside the last box were two things. A small paper note, and my severed finger. The note only had three words written on it, in a dried brown ink. Merry Christmas, Jack. I learned something pretty interesting today. Apparently, hanging upside down for too long can be fatal. 
Now, I'm not going to go into everything that led us to the moment of this discovery because most of it isn't that important. But believe me when I say it was weird and stupid and involved thousands of leeches. We were suspended by rusty chains wrapped tightly around our bottom halves some 10 or so feet off the ground in a mysterious underground building that had somehow gone unnoticed for decades in the forest next to the gas station where I work. It was cold and damp and our only light source were the trio of burning barrels organized in a triangle around us and I'm pretty sure this place wasn't ventilating any of that smoke. I was annoyed, at least I had my coworker Jerry there hanging next to me volunteering as a distraction from the situation at hand. To pass the time, he showed off his impressive repertoire of show tunes and told awful dad jokes, despite my repeated requests for him to stop. Around the two or three hour mark, our captor came back to check and see how we were doing. Maybe he was there to taunt us, I don't really know. His motivations were unclear. At first, when I heard the metal door scrape open, I was relieved that we were finally getting this show on the road. I don't want to sound ungrateful, but there's only so many times I can hear Jerry ask if his joke had gone under my head. <sighs> he walked into the room slowly, one deliberate step after the other, and I'm sure he had theme music playing in his head and probably thought that he looked way cooler than he actually did. He was wearing cargo pants, a black leather jacket, and an apron spattered with blood. In one hand, he held a machete, in the other, an oversized hook, and on his face, he wore the st- stupidest mask I had ever seen, like some kind of nightmare Bugs Bunny with black fur, sharpened buck teeth, and a pointy, elongated ear that scraped the top of the door frame as he entered. He pointed the machete right at me and said something in an, uh, an intimidating yet muffled voice. What? I asked him. He repeated himself, now slightly more annoyed, but still equally as muffled. What's he saying? asked Jerry. I have no idea, I answered. The man in the mask made a muffled scream and shook his weapons at us. Dude, just take the mask off, Jerry said, interrupting the muffle. Yeah, we know that's you, Bo. We're, we're not idiots. You smell like Axe body spray and you've been casing the gas station for like a week now. His name was Bo Kavia. From those of you who aren't from the Deep South, that's B-E-A-U-X-C-O-U-V-I-L-L-I-O-N. And he had been a huge jerk for as long as I had known him. We met back in elementary school and established on day one that we weren't going to be friends. He wasn't the first person that I would have expected to resort to kidnapping and torture, but I wasn't all that surprised by this development either. It would be generous of me to say that Bo was a product of his upbringing. Sure, he came from a stupid, angry family in a stupid, angry town, and one might be tempted to say that he never had much of a chance of breaking the cycle, but I feel like maybe that's letting Bo off the hook too easily. My memories of Bo growing up most revolve around attempts to avoid him in gym class, and out of gym class, and everywhere. In 10th grade, Bo had a brief stint of popularity after the school board refused his grant request for $5,000 to sponsor a high school clan club. The student organization intended to celebrate Anglo-Saxon heritage by driving four-wheelers around in the mud. He and his father, well, mostly his father, sued on the basis of racial discrimination and settled out of court for an undisclosed sum. After that, he started shopping for clothes exclusively at Hot Topic and wearing his ginger orange hair in spikes like a 90s punk rocker. Then he printed off a bunch of copies of the anarchist cookbook from the computer lab, started selling cigarettes in the school parking lot, spray painted a bunch of swastikas on the teacher's cars, and eventually made a name for himself as the edgy too cool for school kid. Shortly after that, he literally became the too dumb for school kid and got kicked out for bad grades and chronic truancy. They sued the school again, but I never heard how that case turned out. I didn't keep up with him, except for what I overheard at the gas station. He was still stupid and angsty, and he blamed everyone else for everything. From his multiple DUIs to his sudden and inexplicable weight gain, Bo was Always pretty husky, but these days, he was about four feet tall, lying flat on his back, which was one more reason why it was so pointless for him to wear a mask. When we first noticed Bo hanging out in the gas station, I assumed that he was just planning on robbing us. See, he was never anything even remotely clever, but the level of suspicious that he was behaving was... Um, it was on the verge of comical, wearing a hat and a trench coat. 
parking his truck at the edge of the lot, squinting to see if he had any security cameras anywhere in the building, coming in twice a day and never buying anything. The last Friday, he tried to talk up the female cashier while they were alone, and I'm sure that he thought that he was being seductive. But, and that's the power of self-delusion for you. Rosa told me all about it after I came in to take over the safe. He asked if we had any hidden weapons in the store, because if I needed it, he was more than happy to stick around and offer me his um, protection. Well, I said, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? Uh, did he open with that? He started by being super creepy and asking me where I was from, um, how long I worked here, yada yada. Then he asked if I was alone. Why would he think that that was okay to ask? What would you tell him? Oh, I lied. I said you, Jerry, and Mac were in the back, uh, rotating inventory. Wait, whoa, what? Who's Mac? He's a guy I made up to tell Bo. Mac is an ex-marine with impulse control problems. He's just trying to do right by his ex-wife ever since they let him out of the slammer, where he did time for a crime he didn't commit. All he wants to do is be a part of his kids' lives, make some extra cash here at the gas station while he tries to take night classes to get his MBA. But an old acquaintance from his days in the service comes back into his life suddenly and unexpectedly, pulling Mac back down a dark rabbit hole that will change everything that he stands for. Will Mac make the right call? Find out on Mac the Knife. Anyway, I think we need to call Deputy O'Brien. Yeah, well, there's really not much that she can do until he actually breaks the law. You don't need to put a gun under the counter. Do you have any idea how ridiculous it is that we don't keep a stash of weapons here at the gas station? Um, I'll think about it. I did think about it. I really did. And I even came to the conclusion that Rosa was right. We should start arming ourselves, just in case. But then I got lazy and started reading a book. And then I forgot about it. And then last night I came in to take over for Jerry and start my overnight shift. But he wasn't there. Instead of Jerry, I found this fat dummy holding a machete and a gun. Wearing this silly rabbit mask. Forcing me into the back cab of his truck. And then he drove me out to the woods down an old dirt road to a giant metal bunker door and forced me inside, down a concrete hallway coated in dirt and graffiti past rooms half filled with stagnant rainwater, uh, past giant metal silos, crumbling columns and metal beams, and finally into this huge empty room where he tied me up with chains and hoisted me to the ceiling, next to Jerry. And that's how we got here. Between knock-knock jokes and Jerry's terrible a cappella rendition of Broadway hits, we wondered out loud what Bo's endgame was. The room he had us placed in contained a giant pentagram freshly painted on one wall with a ladder, a brush, and uh, an open can from Sherman Williams sitting next to it. After that, I surmised that all the blood on Bo's apron was actually just paint. The best theory we could come up with was that he had gone off the deep end and he was planning to sacrifice us to the devil. Turns out, our theory wasn't that far off. Bo finally took off his mask, revealing the look of annoyance on his chubby round face. You shit bricks don't even know what kind of hurt you're in for, do you? A moment passed, and I said, Oh wait, were you were you waiting for an answer? I'm I'm sorry, I thought I thought you were being like rhetorical. You think you're so smart, don't you? Well, you know what? You aren't. Come on, Bo, I said. Just let us down from here. We can pretend this whole thing never happened. No, we won't, interjected Jerry. As soon as you let us go, I swear, I'm heading to the sheriff's station to hand your ass in, and there's nothing you can do to stop me or change my mind. I cut my eyes at him and muttered a quiet, Hot up. Something must have clicked in his head because Jerry started to backtrack. Oh, oh, yeah, you're right. Never mind, Bo. I forgive you. Now, let us go, or else. Bo let out a forceful laugh that didn't sound even remotely convincing and then said, <laughs> You're staying here for the rest of eternity. This is where you'll die. Did you know that the Chinese use death from hanging upside down as her most fierce form of torture? Again, I caught myself waiting for him to continue, only to realize he was asking us a question. Oh, uh... No, 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 I, I didn't know that. Well, let me explain to you the different stages of pain you'll go through before death. First, you'll feel your lungs slowly being crushed under the weight of a, your other organs until the very act of breathing becomes nearly impossible. 
Then your heart will overload from the extra work of pumping blood all the way to your toes and back. And then the vessels in your eyes will rupture. You'll go permanently blind as you struggle for each breath. And then, after you're finally dead, I will bleed you dry and leave your bodies down here to rot. I mean, I'm not a doctor. But none of that sounded right. However, I wasn't about to tell Bo that he needed to, you know, up his torture game. Hey! Bo yelled, pointing his machete at the guy hanging to the other side of Jerry. What's going on with that one? By that one, um, he was referring to Mel. The new part-timer that Jerry had trained when Bo had come in earlier to kidnap him. It was his first day, and the poor guy was already in a secret underground torture chamber. Jerry answered, Yeah, he passed out right off the bat. Uh, yeah, we tried to wake him up, but he's lights out hard. Hey, Mel! Mel, wake up! You're missing the villain monologue! Jerry swung an arm at Mel, but we were all suspended just out of reach of one another. Is that guy dead already? I studied Mel for a moment. I couldn't see any breathing or other signs of life. Yeah, I said sadly. I think he is. Wow! Bo said with a strange smile. I did it! I took my first life! Now I know how it feels. This power is amazing. It's something you pathetic sheep are never going to feel. You'll never know the power of snuffing out another person's very existence. Jerry chuckled and said, <laughs> Okay, dude. Oh, this is it. I have everything I need. Do you idiots want to guess what's about to happen next? No. We both answered at the same time. Now I have what I need to summon forth the beast. Tergon! He is an eternal being from another world, stronger than you could have ever fathomed. I've given him everything he needs to enter our realm, everything except for the final ingredient. The blood of a man in tortured anguish. Bo went to the corner where the chains were all connected to an old crank device. And he turned the wheel until Mel's body was lowered all the way to the floor. Then he unhooked Mel's chains, listened for a heartbeat, really... I guess he should have done those, those two in opposite order. Then he dragged Mel across the floor to the spot in front of the pentagram. Hey, dude. Jerry whispered to me. Want to get out of this? I think we should seriously reconsider buying a shotgun or something for the store. Bo got down on his knees and fished a large pocket knife out of his cargo pants, flicked it open, and kissed it. You losers are about to see something that you're not even worthy to behold. The gates of hell will open, and you will literally be in the presence of the Dark Lord, Kerrigan. Tell me, have either of you seen an actual god before? Yeah, we both said in unison. I look over to Jerry. Wait, really? Wh when did you see a god? Oh, it was back when you were in the hospital for a few days, getting your, like, leg thing taken care of. There was this bat god named, uh, Plabu or something. He was trapped in a small universe thing and a bottle of, of strega liquor. Of course, I was on a lot of mushrooms at the time, so I might have imagined it. What about you? I answered, remember that time we were all escaping the zombie nudists in that underground cavern and we got separated by those giant hands that burst out of the walls? Yeah, I, I, got, I got sucked into that throne room of a dark tree god. Turned out to be a really cool guy, though. Um, of course, I was on a lot of painkillers at the time, so I might have... So I, I might have imagined that. Our lives are weird. They responded. Hey! Bo yelled. I'm being serious here. This is real, and you're about to see for yourselves. Watch. With two hands around the hilt, he plunged the knife into Mel's chest. Mel's eyes shot open, and he screamed and bolted to his feet. It worked! Jerry yelled. Mel is a zombie! Mel screamed again and looked at the weapon sticking out of his chest. Mel! Go get help! I yelled. Bo struggled to get his fat ass to his feet, but Mel turned around, punched him in the face, and darted out the door down the hallway. Get back here! Bo screamed as he threw his hook after the escaping victim. It clanged against the wall several feet from the door and fell to the ground, and Bo huffed and ran out after him. A few minutes later, Bo came back into the room with his head hung low, his eyes red and watery, and snotty blood flowing messily from his nostrils. It looked like that punch might have left Bo with a broken nose, and as pathetic as he looked, we couldn't possibly feel sorry for him. All your fault, he growled at us. Yeah, how do you figure? 
actually. You lied to me. You tricked me into believing Mel was actually dead. Jerry snapped his fingers and said, Bitch, get off this persecution complex. You're the one that brought us down here to torture us to death. You don't get to cry over how we weren't nice to you. Now I'm gonna kill you! Bo hollered. Yeah? So you say, Jerry taunted. Bo wiped his bloody nose off on his sleeve and flung it onto the ground and screamed again. You have no idea how powerful I'm gonna be. You're gonna learn your place. You're all gonna respect me. And when I'm done, I... He stopped mid-sentence, and his face went pale. And then he turned and looked at his bloody spatter on the floor, then at the pentagram on the wall. <laughs> what? He stammered to nobody in particular. Jerry gave me a look that said, This dude is four equal sides short of a square. Oh, yes, of course. He was speaking to the wall. So, like, uh, you want to let us down now, or what? I asked. Bo looked at me with a giant ugly smile and asked, Do you guys hear that too? Hear what? He responded. That voice! He's right there! Bo pointed at the pentagram. He can hear me, and he's telling me that I've done well. The blood was good. My blood, he just needs more. Of course, all he needs to come forth is to, to make for me to make the ultimate sacrifice. Bo picked up his machete with his right hand and held it to his left wrist, then closed his eyes and took a deep breath. This is it. This is why he chose me to summon Kerrigan. Because he knew when the time came, I would have the strength to do what's necessary. Um, uh, wait. Oh, hold on. Who chose you for what? I said, I'm lost. Yeah, Jerry said. Me too. I, w I wasn't really paying attention. Was Mel a zombie or what? Bo opened his eyes, forced another fake laugh, and said, <laughs> There's a man in town. I never got his name, but I, I didn't have to. He found me. He offered me a job. He gave me purpose. And now I'm part of something greater than myself. All he asks is I summon Karagon into this world. It's all part of a great plan, and soon, soon it'll be finished. He closed his eyes. He lifted the machete, then slowly put it back against his skin. Then we waited. For like 30 seconds. Eventually, Jerry crept into the silence in his best Emperor Palpatine voice. Yes, that's it. Do it. Let the darkness be your strength. Let the anger guide you. Let the hate flow through you. Dude, I said, quit it. You're, you're going to mess him up. Bo threw the weapon to the ground and screamed at us again. You bitches have no idea what it's like. How hard I have to struggle. I've gone my entire life putting up with, with shit stains like you two, trying to keep me down. I'm sick and I'm tired of it. Soon, Terragon will come and all the people that make life worse, all you people, will get exactly what you deserve. I had actually forgotten that he still had a gun until this moment, until he pulled it out of his waistband and his, his cargo pants and said, This is what real strength looks like! And I put it into his mouth. I closed my eyes and said, You, 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 gross, 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 gross. After a few seconds, he still hadn't pulled the trigger. And I opened my eyes to see that he was frozen there with the gun still in his mouth. Uh, hey, man, I have an idea, Jerry said. You're, you're clearly having trouble riding that, uh, that struggle bus over there. Why don't you let me down from here, give me the gun, and I'll kill you. Yeah? What? Sound good? You want to die. I want to kill you. It's a win-win. Bo pulled the gun out of his mouth and spat on the ground. You don't have what it takes to kill anybody. Oh, no, really, I've totally got a hard-on for homicide. Just ask Jack. It's true, I said. Before he worked at the gas station, Jerry was the only surviving member of a murder cult. Bo walked angrily over to the crank wheel and started luring Jerry to the ground. Oh shit, is this actually working? Bo took the chains off Jerry, tossed the gun next to him, and then held the machete like a baseball bat right underneath me and said, Okay, asshole, here's the deal. You can't back out now. If you don't spill my blood and open the portal, I'm gonna kill your friend and- <laughs> 
Jerry didn't hesitate for one second to shoot. Bo screamed and flopped onto the ground, hugging the foot with a fresh bullet hole. Then Jerry fished his pack of smokes out of his pocket, lit one up, and took a puff. Hey, uh, dude, I said, you wanna let me down from here now? But before we could answer, the fire from the burning barrel started flaring up, roaring, and growling. And before we knew what was happening, they had formed giant cyclones of burning red and blue blazing swirls that climbed up to the ceiling. As the heat from the fire swept over me, I saw a chrysalic sparkling light in the center of the pentagram, growing from the size of a pinprick to an enormous swirling vortex of pure shimmering lights. Well, check that out, Jerry said. Bo started frantically laughing, and I think that he was just about to give us a smug, I told you so, but before he could, an enormous skeletal hand reached out from the void and grabbed him around the waist. I can't exactly describe um, what this hand looked like. It was... That's because I don't think the, the entity it belonged to was part of our world or, or understands a physicist. It was, at the same time, the size of a normal human arm and the size of, of Manhattan Island. It was a color that had never existed. It had five fingers, and each fingertip split into five more fingers, which each broke into five fingers, which broke into five more fingers ad infinitum. I could somehow hear the creature's arm moving with my eyes, and the smell of its flesh was very similar to gumdrops. Uh, Jerry later insisted it smelled more like spiced rum. Bo let out a gasp as the infinite fingers squeezed around him, and then the arm dragged him slowly through the swirling void. Holy shit! Jerry yelled, that asshole had my wallet! Jerry! I yelled to get his attention. Then he looked up at me. I pointed at the spot on the ground where the dumbass Bo's foot blood had started the pool. You have to figure a way to close the portal! Jerry put his lit cigarette between his lips, unzipped his fly, and started pissing into the puddle of blood. And amazingly, it worked! A noise like a crack of thunder filled the room and the portal disappeared, along with all of the light as the fires from the burning barrels immediately extinguished themselves. In the darkness, all I could hear was the sound of Jerry pissing on the floor. After a while, he finished up and said, Wow, that's a relief. Man, I gotta tell you, I've been holding it ever since he kidnapped us. Do you let me down now or what? Oh, yeah, sorry, I'm on it. It took about ten minutes for him to find the wheel in the dark and lower me to the ground. And by the time we got the chains off, You'd hear sirens going louder in the distance. Deputy O'Brien took our statements, then threw them away and told us to try again. Our second version of the events left out the part where an evil being reached into our world to grab Bo and drag him into a hell dimension. She informed us that the building was some kind of satellite power plant for, I don't know, since the 50s? And the place was shut down and demolished, but they forgot about the basement level. And after a few years, nature reclaimed it. From the look of things, Bo had been trying to live out there by himself. Officially, he was a lone gunman. A single maniac. With him gone, we had nothing to worry about. Unofficially, we're all a little on edge about who hired him to summon a demon. Maybe we'll find out. Maybe we won't. Either way, we need to hire somebody to replace Mel because something tells me that he isn't coming back to work. But in other news, I just learned that the carnival is coming to town soon, so that's pretty exciting. Until next time, this is Jack from the gas station. Hey there, everyone who's listening on YouTube or those of you who are listening on the podcast. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta. And before you head out for the night, I just wanted to let you know about a couple of things. Without you, the show doesn't take place. So, if you guys would like to support the show, or if you guys would like to get your hands on a couple of cool little things whenever new things come out, check out patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. And any support that you guys show, I really appreciate it. So everyone who's already donated to the Patreon, I really appreciate it. You guys are amazing. I thank you so much for that. If you guys are looking for more Creepypasta story time, there's a new video that's uploaded to this channel or uploaded to the podcast every Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday now. You can be able to get more from me 
at facebook.com slash mrcreepypasta or on Twitter at mrcreepypasta and then the number zero. Thanks so much for listening, kids, and for your support. And sweet dreams.